the evil that men do. We gonna bang your head! You are now listening to the Music Mania podcast, a hard-hitting show featuring all things hard rock and heavy metal. And now here are your hosts, the twins of chaos, Clint Switzer and Paul Lagana. Hello once again. Thank you guys so much for joining us on the Music Mania Podcast. Clint Schweitzer, Paula Gana sitting in here. The Twins of Chaos, as we've been formidably referred to as. Paul, it's great to be here. We want to thank all the fans for joining us. We have a big show going on today, my man. Absolutely, Clint. But before we get into that, I want to let everybody know that you guys can let us know how we're doing. Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, we have a website, anything and everything that you want to hear. Let us know. Let us know how we're doing as well. Yeah, let us know, guys. We appreciate all your feedback. If you have a guest you want to get us to find for you to get on the show, we will do it. We will scour the earth. We will dig down deep. We will find that guest, no matter how obscure, no matter how ridiculous, we will get them on this very show, as long as they're still alive, and even some that aren't. I'm just throwing it out there. So, it's, But today we have a big show. This show is too big, man, for one guest, so we had to bring on two First coming up here in just a little bit, we have Jason McMaster, the enigmatic frontman from Dangerous Toys, one of my favorite bands from the late 80s. I love the toys. They're coming to Kansas City June 11th at Harris. We're going to ask Jason about that. And then Paul, Mike Dupke, the former drummer from Wasp, We're going to get into stuff with him about Blackie Lawless playing with Wasp. He was in the band for nine years. What went wrong? What could possibly go wrong when playing with Blackie Lawless and Wasp? Not only that, but he also played with John Mellencamp and... Hotel Diablo. Absolutely. Going to get into the, all that with him and much more. Paul, so much going on. We talked last week about uh, GNR and all the rumors swirling. Well, since then, a lot's gone on. They played the Troubadour. The dates are announced. Paul, it is on Guns N' Roses. Summer 2016. I think it's time to start gearing up, listen, making some mixed CDs, getting ready for some GNR because it's coming. It's coming to Arrowhead Stadium this June 29th. We will be there. We are going to be there, Clint, and... Whether, again, uh, the rumors about Adler or Izzy Stradlin joining the band, whether or not that's true or not, so far it is not true. Uh, we are going to enjoy that. We are going to enjoy the show. And uh, I think everybody else will, too. We're going to enjoy it for what it is. I mean, obviously, it's the first time since 1993 that Guns N' Roses will be, uh, well, in, in this sense, with Axel Slash and, and Duff McKagan. That's, that's what's important here. That's the members you're going to focus on. Uh, obviously, it'd be nice if Izzy and, and Matt Sorum or uh, Steven Adler, obviously, the uh, original drummer, were there. Right now, that doesn't look like the case. We're going to ask Jason McMaster about that. I know what a fan he is. going to get his opinion on this because he is very opinionated on all things rock related. And I, we actually have Jason on the phone right now. Jason McMaster, how's it going, man? Welcome to the show. How's it? How are you doing, buddy? Playing, teaching, living, breathing rock and roll. Uh, that's 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 what we want to hear, Jason. And I, and yeah. I, we're going to get a chance to catch up again this summer because once again, uh, you, you're, you're you're Austin, Texas based, Texas band, uh, Dangerous Toys, also Broken Teeth, but coming back to Kansas City this summer, June 11th. It is your second home. Yeah, you might as well just move into my basement. I think at, at this point. Well, I, we've always had a good uh, a good little crowd in in Kansas City, and. Um I have to kind of give it up to Voodoo inside Harris. That's a pretty sweet venue, and they really know how to treat uh, bands and fans really well there. So, you know, it, it's it's great playing. There's a lot of little cool clubs and stuff and on the north side as, as well as, you know, down in Kansas and everything, and, and we've, we've done all that, and we've had a real good time, but... I think we got a good thing going over here, you know, that AC works and uh, food is hot. <laughs> That's all the expectations that that you need in the world. But yeah, I think I think I first met you back in I think it was oh seven or oh eight, you guys played up here up north at a place called Woody's and that's kinda of where it all started. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was good times, man. That was uh, that was back yeah. few back a few years, and uh, you and Scott and the boys rolled up and uh, had a buddy of mine. I worked for CD Warehouse at the time, and uh, had you guys up here, man. It was just it's great times. Always great to see you guys up here, and I think you guys only have one more date for the summer. What's uh, you guys plan on anything else, or just kind of take it taking the dates as they come, so to speak? Yeah, I mean the phone rings and the phone doesn't ring, and then the phone rings and then the phone doesn't ring. It doesn't really mean anything. We've been absolutely lucky in the way that we haven't had to go fishing for shows um, all 
the way through the summer. Even it's it's been I think our busiest uh, last year was our busiest year. So you know uh, we don't really have anything going for uh, for the summer yet after after we come see you guys. But uh, you know they know the number. They know the number, and if you want to come see it, you better get to Kansas City. That's June 11th at Harris at Voodoo. I mean, that's a great venue. Like you, like you said, I've seen Motorhead in there. I mean, I've seen Ace Freely in there. I mean, it's definitely a Queensryche. There's been a lot of uh, big bands in there. Are going to be great. To have. You got I mean, Dangerous Toys is just flat out one of my favorite bands of that era. You know, late 80s, uh, early 90s. You guys came out in you know 1989 was that debut you guys came out with, and I mean, I want to go back to that because um, I, I think you joined the band in you know 87, 88. What was kind of your guys' vision? Because you guys were different. You guys have this like Texas Roadhouse kind of Texan stiff kind of ACDC type sound mixed with the sound that was popular uh, in at the late 80s. How did it get going? How did you join uh, Dangerous Toys? And uh, what was kind of your vision on that first album? It was, it all happened, some would argue and say uh, it happened too fast for us. Uh, some people say, you know, oh, it was magical. You know, some people would have uh, all these different ways to look at it. We felt um, we felt good uh, just even playing some cover songs. I was in a thrash metal band, you know, kind of a technical proggy metal band called Watchtower for pretty much the decade prior to my early earliest moment with the toys. And so they knew me uh, as a popular front guy in town, and they had lost their singer. They were a band, Dangerous Toys used to be called Onyx, and they had a girl singer. They lost her, they called me as a fill-in, and they were just like a, a cover band. They had some original stuff, but you know they were playing covers, and what they were offering me sounded like a lot of fun, and uh, you know, I started rehearsing with those guys, just learning some cover songs, and we didn't even have a band name. We we knew that we weren't gonna. I wasn't gonna fit under the name Onyx, and um, so eventually, I mean, literally, like six weeks in, the phone rang, and it was there. They were pretty much a house band at this club that's no longer uh, it called the Back Room, and. Um, a lot of people knew it. A lot of people played it. Uh, and uh, long story short, uh, we we went under the name Dangerous Toys. It was a, 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 a we felt at the time was a fairly weak name, but it didn't sound like anything else we heard at the time. It was like, hey, this guy wants us to play. He's on the phone. Okay, well, what are we gonna call it? Oh shit, I don't know. <laughs> Dangerous Toys, yeah, that's good enough. Yeah, here you go. That's what we're going to do it. So we started playing under that name. And um, about six months later, we got a record deal. So it happened really, really fast. I mean, a year after we got signed, we were, we were you know, on the road and on MTV. It happened super fast yeah. for us. Some people would say that's it's not supposed to happen like that. You you don't have longevity when it's just like a boom. You know what I mean? A flash in the pan, a, a one hit wonder, or whatever. Uh, you know, I would agree with with some of it some of the time, and and I would say, you know, I don't know. There's some some timeless moments on that first record. I mean, people won't let that record die. That means something. You know? Yeah, yeah. 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 scared, teasing, pleasing, Queen of the Nile, sporting a Woody songs you still hear on on XM Hair Nation today, and in in my own living room, of course. But right, right, sure. Jason, well, there's uh, also some things uh, that are happening, uh, you know, at the time of of you know the big boom of you know dare I call it the coattails of Guns N' Roses, you know. So they were the hit act at the time. So all the labels, you know, hey, we need one of those, you know. So they look for a band that's got a singer with red hair and tattoos and sings real high. So, Perfect. you know, it was kind of fit. Yeah, it was, it was kind of, you know, the, the shoe fit. And, you know, I, I feel like it was, we were one of those guilty things that happened and it was short lived because uh, you know it didn't take long for there to be a new, be a new style of music that was the trend 
and that's okay because uh, you know GNR had a trending album with Appetite and they had sold so many of those that it didn't matter what they did after that with uh, Use Your Illusion records good or bad or great or the you know epic or you know whatever you want to call it it was you know Use Your Illusion stuff was was a big change for Guns N' Roses and even for Guns N' Roses fans. I mean, there was a lot of things on there that were kick-ass, but it wasn't an, another appetite. It wasn't like a right. Van Halen 2 or something like that. It was very different. It was a double album that had all these ballads on it. It was, it was just a, a hit in the face, a car crash, beautiful disaster kind of a moment and time. And, uh, you know, whether it was the right or wrong thing to do, to do it, it, it didn't matter at the time, but they had had such a hit with Appetite, it almost didn't matter. So, um, you know, they did they did great with that, and I think that the trend changing right after that uh, with, you know, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, stuff like that, the Seattle sound, the good thing about that is, is it helped clean the clock of a bunch of crappy bands that were, like, in the, in the same boat as Dangerous Toys, where, you know, they had that, well, I'll just go ahead and say it again, the redheaded singer with long hair who sang high, there was a lot of those kind of bands that just were not very good. Absolutely. And so what that did is it cleaned the clock. It got rid of a bunch of those guys who either were, you know, another label's version of Dangerous Toys being the coattails of Guns N' Roses kind of signings. And uh, I think that the, the class of 89 had a few bands that really lasted and did did pretty good and ended up making a two or three records after that actually did okay. Junkyard, Rhino Bucket, Gator's Toys, Circus of Power. Uh, you know, a lot of kick-ass, sort of dark, you know, uh, still kind of boogie-woogie, hard rock, ACDC, Aerosmith, and Lewis rock and roll band. They Absolutely. were a little less, a little less warrant poisony, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can throw Helix in there too. I would think so. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, 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 Helix is. <laughs> oh, I saw Helix in the early '80s. You know, we're talking, we're talking class of '89. I mean, Helix was already. I had already seen them play in Texas as early as '85 or '86. You know. Right. Right. So, but you know, I guess that's around the same time that Poison came out too. So. Well, even before that, uh, you were asked to play by uh, Vinnie Paul for Pantera, or actually audition. Uh, what was that like? It was a phone call, and it was felt good to be to be loved, you know, to be respected enough to think that that was a good idea. Um, I don't really have any regrets, honestly. I think that. You know, I don't know if I would have been short-lived or, or not with that because, I mean, they knew I was a metalhead. And if that's where they were going, you know, I, I really think Anselmo really kind of helped them develop where they needed to go as a band. I don't know if I would have had that sort of play into what they were they were doing, you know. So, I mean, Pantera took the world by storm with Anselmo, with no one else. So there's no telling what would have or could have or would not have happened to Pantera if I, you know, if even I would have had a chance at at getting the gig, you know. Well, uh, the biggest but, tour... Go Sorry, the biggest tour I mean that you guys wound up doing it was it was a actually after you released Hellacious Acres in '91, and you did the Operation Rock and Roll tour. I mean, you had Mot Motorhead, Priest, Metal Church, and Alice Cooper on that bill. I mean, just just talk about that. What a defining moment it was uh, for Dangerous Toys getting to to be a part of that tour. At that moment, I can say I've toured with my idols. I can die a happy man. <laughs> this is this is over now, and I'd be okay with it. Absolutely. Seriously. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, it doesn't get any better than that. Those are the people that showed everyone else how to do it. You know, Metal Church was one of those bands from the early mid-80s that used to play shows with Metallica when they were just a bar band. And, though, you know, they all are coming from the same place. They write amazing heavy metal songs. And I just saw Metal Church on the Monsters of Rock cruise, and they blew my mind. Yeah, you know uh, they were one of those bands, love them or hate them, but they were part of a genesis. They were part of a moment of American metal that 
you can't take that away. No. And uh, it was good to be, I mean, the, the odd man out on that tour, we're talking about Operation Rock and Roll 91, the odd man out is Dangerous Toys. People might disagree with what I'm saying, but I can say it. I'm in the fucking van. I can say <laughs> it, you know. Um, you know, with what Motorhead and, uh, and Priest and Cooper have brought to the world of rock and heavy metal is formidable. It's it's God size, so you can't. You, you, as a fan, before any, before all else, you couldn't have done. You couldn't have sold me on anything else. Uh, some people like to add to this question about the Operation Rock and Roll and the state of heavy metal and hard rock in '91. They like to add, well, you know, articles and pundits are talking about how that was, you know. Uh, Sony Music uh, cleaning house because of the uh, the new trending Seattle sound, and that's you know what that's exactly right. Then people like to say, I sound like I'm interviewing myself. <laughs> no, I'm not. They like to say they like to say shit like, uh, well, you know, what did you think of, uh, of you know some uh, a bunch of the tour canceling because of lack of ticket sales? And I clear my throat and I say. What do you mean a bunch of them canceling because of lack of ticket sales? I don't recall that. I recall six weeks of pretty fucking solid touring. Now, there were a few shows that were hit with slow sales and some of the bands dropped off and there may have been maybe two, three shows that were pulled off because they were even worse. So they were worse off than that. It didn't affect anything. What were we supposed to do? Oh man, and throw a fit and quit the band, and you know, no man, you, you, you know, that's economics. That's economics. That's a promoter pulling out. Not it doesn't mean rock and roll is dead. You know, I don't understand why they would want to like us to sort of dwell on uh, you know those very few moments that the promoter got cold feet and couldn't afford to pull the show, you know, had to pull the show. Yeah, it, it, it carved you know, out that, a great that, niche. That happens, that happens sometimes, it but does. so what, you know? And right. You weren't the only one that that happened to either, by the way. I, I lived that era myself, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to actually when you first got started, Jason. What, uh, what defined you as a singer back then, and when did you realize, hey, man, this is what I want to do? Well, I started out as a bass player, and uh, I was afraid of the microphone. You couldn't get me near the microphone. That's shocking, actually. <laughs> I, was about, I was about 13. I was in my, band, in my first band at age 14, 15. I was just happy to be able to start a song with some dudes and end the same song with some dudes, you know. You know, oh, I'm playing with a drummer, you know, oh, shit, you know what I mean? And if starting and ending together, that's huge when you're that age and you've had no lessons and you're just kind of putting it all together by feel. And um, that was great. Uh, a few years later, uh, that was down in South Texas. A few years later, I moved to, uh, to Austin, Texas. There was a lot more music and art here, uh, a lot more freaks. And uh, it was easy, it was real easy for me to meet people uh, who wanted to do the same thing that I did. And I was still a bass player, but about, I don't know, a few months into it, it turned into something like, you know, oh, um, the band I have is having singer auditions and these people would call or come in, and, yeah, I'm a singer, and they'd come in and, when you and other your other bandmates are looking at each other with the stink eye and then looking at this person that calls himself a singer, and you know telepathically you're telling you, I'm looking at my drummer, my drummer's looking at me, and we're both going, we're not even singers, and we blow this dude away. <laughs> so we ended up just being the singers. And about six months later, um, both of that band had fallen out and both of us were not, he was not playing drums anymore and I was not playing bass anymore. We were singing for totally different bands. 
we were both we had both turned into heavy metal front men, uh, all because of that bad singer experience. Right. You know? Right. Um, I I had ended up in a situation where, and that was the Watchtower gig. Uh, I had ended up in a room with uh, the Watchtower guys who obviously had a bass player and they had were having a little bit of a, a tick with their singer and I just met those guys and I was just trying to meet people and and um, you know kind of network and stuff and try to keep going as a bass player uh, who, which I had obviously the story kind of ended with me and my drummer ended up doing all the singing while we were playing drums and singing and playing bass we were both singing so we were sort of fronting our band but we didn't quit our instruments right away it was you know like I said six months in we were we ended up you know we're looking for other things and we both ended up becoming singers but my situation was oh your singer's not gonna show up you know and obviously you have a bass player sure I'll sing some songs <laughs> you know just hanging out in a in a rehearsal with sure. the Watchtower guys and, and I never left they wanted me they hired me a week later I was, you know, visiting them, watching these dudes rehearse, and their singer didn't show up. And a week later, they called me and, and said, "We want you to be our singer." It's like I had been, like I said, I had only been singing about six months, and these guys were destined for something. I didn't know what, but uh, you know, Watchtower's Dream Theater and Death and Cynic and a lot of bands that are, you know, kind of prog metal or or totally. Uh, you know, underground sort of, um, you know, extreme metal people will uh, will cite Watchtower as an influence more than more than once. Sometimes in print, sometimes in interviews. Sure. Pretty cool. Yeah, and absolutely. So anyway, but I did that. I did that for a long time, and that's I cut my teeth as a singer in Watchtower here in Austin. And uh, we didn't know that it was going to be a, a pioneering movement. And uh, when the toys got got a hold of me to just kind of do some more moonlighting, you know, little did I know it was, you know, a, a full-on record deal was going to pop in our lap. And the rest is kind of history. Absolutely. You guys carved out such a wonderful niche. You've had a wonderful career uh, uh, fronting many bands, uh, Broken Teeth. Of course, you guys are still playing. has got some shows coming up uh, down in Texas this summer. And before we let you go, Jason, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you because I know you're a fan. I know you're a fan of, of rock music. I know you're, it's a, such a passion to you. And, of course, last, just, um, I guess it was uh, Friday night at the Troubadour, you had Guns N' Roses, uh, Axel and Slash and Duff playing together with uh, Frank Fair and Richard Fortas. You know, say what you will. Are you on board with this uh, Guns N' Roses reunion? They're going to be doing stadiums this summer. It's going to kind of ambitious. What are What are your thoughts here on this situation? I think I think if uh, if you are a Guns N' Roses fan and you didn't get to see you know the the band in, intact, so to speak, uh, that's a great moment, and they're you're about to have the uh, opportunity to spend a lot of money. But you'll have the opportunity to see, you know, as close to the real band as possible. I think that that's fantastic. Um, I have no interest, honestly, as a ticket buyer to go see that. Um, I think that it would be awesome if uh, you could get Izzy and Adler yeah. to be in the band and do that for real, even if it was just like a a short tour, you know, 15 dates, 20 dates, play the major cities. You know, they could literally milk the shit out of that in the <laughs> right way if they wanted to, but I don't think, I think I hear, and don't quote me because I just don't know, um, that Izzy's not interested at right. all. As of now, yeah. Hearing that too. Yeah, and Adler, they thought maybe, maybe he was going to show up at the Troubadour gig in, in Hollywood Friday night. It didn't, it didn't wind up happening. What What's going to go on with that? Don't know, but like you said, I kind of I I tend to agree with you on that. I mean, it's like for me, I'm 32 years old, Jason. Like this will be my first chance to see GNR with with those members. Paul here, a little older, so he's yeah. you know he 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 has the experience. But you know, it's going to hit Kansas City. It's going to be at Arrowhead Stadium. Uh, it's going to be a bombastic rock and roll show. It's going to be expensive, like you said. But I guess you're just kind of left. You either go or you don't. And 
I guess we're gonna have to check it out this time. <laughs> I guess I guess we got your answer. Yeah. You're not. You're you're yeah, out on this. That, I, I think that everybody should go see it, train wreck or not. I think that there's <laughs> something to to something that's really incredible about you don't you don't want to love, and we can we can kind of end on this if it's okay. What sure. I what I love about rock and roll so much is you know exactly what we're talking about here that it doesn't die the songs don't sing themselves therefore it doesn't die so there's this cycle of 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 rock music they won't die i mean it's unfortunate that motorhead is you know it it, it dies in the way of that but motorhead will never die Ace of Spades is always going to be in movies. It's always going to be on car commercials. It's always going to be a staple song. It's always going to be, and as well as other Motorhead songs are staple songs in my eyes. But you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. Dio, is he gone? He's not really gone. Holy Diver is on the radio every fucking day. And that's not the only Dio song that's out there. Man on the Silver Mountain is on the radio somewhere every day. His work with all of his bands is is as worthy as his last great moment. So yep. it's never going to die. I love it that there's people out there that want to talk to me about all of this stuff because I can talk about it all the time. <laughs> right on. Um, because it's it's very important. It's a vitality. I think that it's important for people to have music in their lives, and if they don't, they're fucking dead. Uh, I'll leave you with this, not to sound, you know, like a seer or something, but, you know, if you have a favorite song or a song that you loved when you were young, and you don't, let's say, for some weird reason, you don't hear the song for 5, 10, 15, God forbid, 20 years, but when you hear it, you remember all the words, you remember a, the smell of the room from the first time you heard it, you remember all of these things. Uh, your brain works that way. But here's another thing to think about. You love that song for a reason. And the reason is, is that is the language. That is a language that you know that you didn't have to learn. That yeah. song came on and you were drawn to it. Here's the end of the day. Everything else other than whatever that language is that that is that's my song, that's my music. These dudes are talking to me. That Love belongs it. to you. No one can ever take that away. Here's the thing. Everything else should be easy to ignore. Yep. True words never spoken. Jason McMaster, I'll tell you what, man. Thanks so much for the time. Let's catch up when you the toys hit Kansas City this June, man. Let's catch up and uh, and, and, and and say hello, my man. It's been a pleasure. Sounds good. You guys have a great day. Thanks a lot, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. And a big thanks to Jason McMaster for joining us. As advertised, he pulled no punches. He told it like it is, just like we do here at Music Mania. Great to hear from him. Can't wait to catch up with the Dangerous Toys June 11th at Harris. Going to be a great gig. Jason was, once again, one of the one of the best guys Absolutely. Uh, Jason, like you said, pulled no punches. The guy told it exactly like it was all things regarding rock. And now it's our pleasure to bring on our next guest. He is the former drummer from Wasp, played with John Mellencamp, played with Hotel Diablo and Hair of the Dog. It is drummer extraordinaire Mike Dupke. Mike, welcome to the show. How's everything going in your world, my man? <laughs> it's going pretty great. I got to say, how's things uh, going with you? Oh, doing awesome, Mike. Uh, just great to have you on. Great to talk uh, some music with you. And uh, before we get into some of your past accolades, which there are many and they are prodigious to say the least, I mean, let's get into what you're up to now. I mean, um, you've been out of WASP for about a year now, a little over a year. And so just what do you got coming on the horizon? And what's going out to, on uh, for you out there uh, out in the stratosphere, man? I've got a couple of cool things coming up. Uh, one thing that I uh, real honor that I had a couple of months ago was that I got to uh, join the staff of uh, Musicians Institute in Hollywood. Uh, and that's uh, it, a really, really cool school. I actually ended up going there and uh, finishing my degree. And I learned, just really fell in love with the whole place. And uh, now I'm honored to uh, be on the staff. Uh, I've got a couple of other playing uh, gigs coming up. I know uh, if you're familiar with uh, the band uh, from the 80s called Bow Wow Wow, yep. uh, I'm actually going to be doing some more gigs with uh, uh, the singer uh, Annabelle Lewin. Oh, sweet. Who is just, she's just beyond cool, and the music from a drum perspective is, is just crazy, nuts, tribal punk party tunes. It's a whole lot of fun to play. 
Mike, back in the day, you worked with legendary roots rocker John Mellencamp. Uh, what was that experience like for you, and what was he like? Um, well, my first attempt, <laughs> my first attempt at college, was at uh, Indiana U, and uh, lucky for me, I actually I got there right at the same time that Kenny Aronoff joined the staff, uh, and I was lucky enough to be put with him as well. Uh, and then Mellencamp put out uh, what was the Human Wheels record. Yep. And with with Kenny on it, and they said they they took kind of like a whole bunch of new uh, direction and chances with uh, some extra percussion stuff. He played stuff like potato chip cans and you know weird cymbals and all this stuff, funny noisemakers. And so they wanted, I guess, John asked Kenny, like you know, I want to get some get some kid in the in the band. And then Mellicamp, reportedly, I was told, saw me with the Indiana. Uh, the basketball pet band uh, wow. going nuts behind the drum kit and he's like he's like who, who, who's that kid in the pet band and, and Kenny said well that's my student so I got to come aboard and play some uh, some stuff with John on percussion alongside Kenny which was just oh, so much fun and yeah I was 19 at the time so that was my first real taste of anything big um, and then a couple months after that, when Mel Campbell wanted to record uh, his next record just like immediately on the fly, Kenny was already out of town, so he brought me in to do uh, some drum tracks, and actually one of them ended up staying on the record, so that was another big honor there. Yeah, that's great stuff, and I mean, I've, I've been a Mellencamp fan all my life, certainly um, a much different style, much different, uh, you know, whole situation than it was for you when you joined Wasp, and I, and I want to get into that because, uh, you know, I'm an, undoubtedly just a giant Wasp fan, but let's look at that era. You joined in, in 2006 um, as Stet Howland, you replaced Stet Howland in Wasp, you come in there and uh, you do three records with Wasp, um, you do many b large festivals, tours overseas, I mean, what was your connection how did you get um hooked up with with blackie and uh you know kind of how did that whole situation come about for you uh the connection i had was a guitar player named mark Zavon, uh who in recent years uh formed an awesome band with uh rex from pantera and uh vinnie apathy called kill devil hill uh but years ago around that time uh, Mark uh, knew me and he knew Blackie and, and Mike Duda and just knew that they were looking for a new drummer. And so he recommended me and I, uh, it's really all it came down to. I tried out uh, and that was it. He, he was like, all right, what are you doing? I go, well, I got a, I got a job that I got to go do four days a week. He's like, all right, tomorrow's going to have to be your last day of work. I'm like, Okay. Yeah, so, and, and and we took off. We went right into the recording, uh, or the writing and recording of Dominator, and uh, you know, and then started just more tours than I could ever keep track of. Well, when you go in an audition for a band like Wasp, and you, and you meet Blackie Lawless, and you go, "What do you play?" I'm the Wasp has so many. I imagine you go in. Uh, you play a song like "The Torture Never Stops," or is it like something from The Idol? I mean, this is it's such a backtrack. It's like, what do you what do you even play in an in an audition with Blackie? If I remember correctly, I met Duda the night before, and he gave me he gave me a disc, and I think the he told me to learn four songs, and I know one of them was "Love Machine," uh, one of them was "The Real Me." And, oh boy, I want to say Invisible Boy, but I could be wrong about that. Actually, I think we only ended up playing uh, those two tunes and just talking the rest of the time. Mike, Wasp hasn't toured here in the U.S. since 2004. Uh, I know you guys played overseas basically during that time. What were the reasons for that? I, I You know, I, I hate to say, I'm really not completely sure, only because... When it comes to like the financial, you know, the, the planning and, and the managing and all the brouhaha and costs, I, I was very much left out of that part. Um, I know we did two, there were two United States runs. There was one in early 08 and there was one in early 2010. But uh, that, was, that was it for the stretch as far as like, you know, big complete tours uh, as long as I was in the band. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure why. I'm sure that... Uh, you know, he would have come to those areas, but maybe it just didn't work out time-wise for, you know, certain places and certain towns. But, you know, we certainly had great crowds in the towns that we did go to. Well, who at that point had better travel accommodations, you or uh, Elvis the mic stand? <laughs> <laughs> Elvis, oh, 
yeah, Alex <laughs> was given the star treatment too. And, and we always laughed. Uh, I always got a big chuckle when, uh, you know, a lot of times when I'd have to come out, like, you know, right, right before festivals or something like that, just to check the drums before the show starts. And the guys, you know, at, at least two guys would be needed to require. Our, you know, would be needed to haul Elvis out there, and Elvis got like you know a bigger standing ovation than I think any any of us did. <laughs> he, was, he was very popular. If he would and fit he, on the he, stage, what's that? If he would fit on the stage, that is that that would happen a time or two where he he just couldn't get it. He couldn't be technically he could not fit on the stage and uh, had to be replaced for a night or two. I mean that that happened a time. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, and I, I, had a, I had a big laugh during the 30 Years of Thunder tour when actually in the middle of uh, my drum solo when the, all the lights were on me, the crew guys brought Elvis out there. And <laughs> like, like early on, I go, wow, the rig is really big in the drum solo. And then I look at it, oh, no, they're just putting Elvis out and he's getting the, well, he's getting the big round of applause, as well he should. Well, I want to talk to you about working with Blackie Lawless, who in my opinion is one of the more underrated songwriters, uh, not only of the 80s and that sort of, 80s metal scene but just in in rock in general and he's he's had a prodigious career himself i mean working the, doing the new york dolls uh you know working with nikki six before the t- bands split off and form motley Crue and wasp but you hear you hear a lot of things about about blackie just as far as uh there's a lot of past members of wasp including you i mean uh, they've the members are coming out you know the johnny rods and the stead howlands and the you know randy pipers and the mike duda like there's just been a, you know mike duda is in there now, but what what is uh, what was it like working with Blackie on a personal level? I say I learned so much from him, especially from a songwriting standpoint. I I don't think I've ever seen a guy sweat over every single note and every single aspect of a tune like he does. He just you know he, he's the guy you know the painter who you know paints the picture and people go oh man that's awesome but no he'll step back. And, uh, you know, one tiny little blip that needs to be, you know, changed of color in the corner. If he thinks that that will make it just that much better, he'll do it. And he'll take the time to figure out, you know, how to make it just as best as he possibly can. Um, I, I always, I don't know, I don't know if I ever told him this, but like, I always, if he had not been, a, you know, a hard rock star, I think he probably would have been like that high school teacher that you had that like was really, really difficult and strict. <laughs> but when you were done, came out, you go, man, that, that guy was the best teacher I ever had. Sure. You know, like just absolutely, you know, ridiculously smart, you know, straight up. And, you know, and, and all of a sudden it's like, at times, really, really funny. He could, that guy could be hilarious. Yeah, and that's something you definitely wouldn't, pick out uh, as a trait for Blackie. It's just, he just seems so serious. His demeanor on stage is just like dark eyes. <clears throat> Excuse me. He just has this kind of demeanor, but like, so you, you leave the band <clears throat> after the, uh, after Golgotha, you recorded Golgotha, which took a few years, but you left in 2015. I mean, what were the circumstances behind that? And I mean, I mean, do you have any regrets and what, and kind of what happened in that situation? No, no regrets at all. It's, it was time. And there were circumstances that came up that, uh, you know, kind of needed me to, uh, I guess, to take my exit around that time. But no, absolutely no regrets. I'm still, you know, still friends with all of them. Uh, and it just I took away just a magnificent, like I said, learning experience and, and getting to, you know, say, hey, now I know what it's, what it's like to do, you know, 23 straight shows in 23 nights or to, you know, well, was I, there was one summer tour, I think it was, two, might have been 2012 or 2013, that I took, I believe it was like tw- something like 22 flights in 29 days uh, just <laughs> to get around to wherever we needed to go. And, it's, you know, it can rattle your brain unless, you know, you're really fueled by the love of what you're doing. And, you know, everyone in the group certainly had that, and that's what made it such a pleasure to work with those guys. Yeah, it was a great era, and it's something that I, you know, I'm disappointed that, um, you know, you're not in the band anymore, that, uh, because I thought it was such, such a, just such a good, set of, the band had such a good vibe during that time. I mean, I think it was uh, Doug Blair, you know, on, on guitar, and you, I mean, you guys just had this. That's real, right. Yeah, just had this really good thing going, but, uh, you know, the, the band plays on, everybody goes on, that's just kind of rock and roll, and you had... Uh, nine years working with Blackie and in that in that limelight. I mean, is there a moment that stands out to you that like 
it was kind of one of those, you know, I can't believe I'm doing this moment. I mean, obviously you worked with John Mellencamp when you were 19 as part of the Indiana University Hoosiers, by the way, pet man. And so is there a moment though on stage where you're just like, oh my God, I'm playing Love Machine right now in front of 30,000 people in Germany. I mean, is there a moment that kind of stands out to you? Oh, there, there were a lot of those little moments. One of them definitely was uh, uh, the Wacken Festival in, I believe it was 2012. Uh, that was the, in fact, I think that was the last show of the big, uh, the big plane flight run that I just mentioned. And we had played somewhere in Europe the night before and then made, uh, took like, like almost like a red-eye flight and we were doing that show in the middle of the afternoon on, as I had no sleep, like none. And all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> you kind of have that moment like you're talking about where you're up there on stage and I'm playing, you know, these tunes and there's 80,000 people out there and you just kind of look up and you go, oh, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> And, but, you know, but because you've got that, you know, that, that sleep deprivation, you know, deliriousness going on that, that makes everything really fun. Um, you know, afterward, like after it's all said and done, you take a deep breath, you go, wow, man, that was, that was really big and really awesome. Well, you know, and this is a kind of a tongue in cheek question, but what, what was harder working with Blackie Lawless for nine years or becoming a, a husband and a father? Which, which one of those is worth <laughs> grading? <laughs> um, well, I can. I don't know. I would not say which one is harder. I definitely know uh, that uh, being a father has definitely tired me out more. Um, I thought I knew sleep deprivation before on uh, tour, uh, but having a uh, having this little guy, he <laughs> definitely sucks the sleep right out of you. Uh, but you know, so far it's been wonderful, and he's even at the age now where you know he's developing his own personality and going, you know, seeing all these little quirks come out one by one. And I go, oh god, he got that for me. Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. It makes me really happy because actually, he, uh, I'll put him up next to the drums or give him a drum to bang on, and he just starts going nuts and you know just slamming his hands down with the, the biggest grin on his face. And you know, I can see my wife going, oh god, we got another. Well, I, I, I absolutely. Well, I know what a fan you are. I know you're uh, such a music fan and a fan of, of rock music. I mean, uh, sure. of course, the hot topic right now, and I'm just kind of getting everyone's opinion on this. Uh, we had Jason McMaster on from Dangerous Toys in our previous oh. segment. Uh, asked him about this. Of course, Guns N' Roses uh, putting this tour together. They're going to do stadiums. It's going to be crazy. Uh, no Steven Adler right now. No Izzy Stradlin. But what are your thoughts on this on this GNR tour? And as a drummer, um, you know, without original drummer Steven Adler, I mean, is that something that kind of irks you, or are you just one of those guys that hey, no original, me- you know, original members isn't that isn't that big deal to you? Or as, as a ticket buyer, would you are you going to go see this? I guess it, it doesn't really irk me, I mainly because, and, and you know what, I haven't seen it. I, I believe Frank is, is still playing drums, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have seen Frank play, and I know that the band is definitely in good hands, for sure. Um, and I guess the only reason I'm not uh, kicking up a whole lot of fuss about Steven or, or, or Matt Sorum is because I love both of those guys. You know, I love the Appetite Destruction and the Use Your Illusion record. So, which one of those two, you know, would you get? Would there, would there be a way to have them both? I don't know. But um, if certainly, if either one of them wanted to come aboard, yeah, it would be it would be awesome. But I, and maybe that might still happen. But just the fact that you know, Slash Dove and Axel are still are you know are back on stage at, at you know one time. That, that's history, you know, in the making right there. It is. And I've always wanted, I wanted to ask, I asked a lot of drummers this for some reason. I don't know why it's specific to drummers because uh, maybe just because you guys have to be able, a lot of times have to be adaptable and, and drummers have to come in and just learn the songs and boom, boom, boom. If you, if you could play a set with one band, living or dead, what would it be? And if, if the answer is Kiss, because I know you're a big Kiss fan, would you, would you put on the makeup? The Peter Chris makeup. Yeah, I've, I've been, I think, like, what, nine of the last 15 Halloweens I've been Peter Chris uh, at some point. So, yeah, huge, huge Peter Chris fan. And, and if I get to meet him someday, that would be, I, that'd be, you know, my bucket list moment for sure. But um, I, I don't know if it would, if it would be Kiss. Actually, I think, uh, although, it would, I don't even know if I'd be able to pull it off. Uh, and the band... Uh, itself doesn't exist anymore, but one of my absolute favorites was a, uh, a band called Strapping Young Lad. Uh-huh, uh-huh. 
that uh, fronted by uh, the wonderful madman Devin Townsend, uh, and I'm just I, I love everything he does. But strapping was just there was a, like a, just a huge brutality combined with a massive sense of humor that I that, you know just, just drew me to that group and you know sonically how the record sounded and of course Gene Hoagland on the drums. I'm just I'm a massive fan of his too. So that would be one. Um, but yeah, I'd probably say those two. I'd say, yeah, Trapping and Lad and, and definitely Kids. If I had a chance to put on the makeup for as much as the fans, you know, might hate it. Oh, who's this guy? I'd be like, oh, come on. We all want to do this. Uh, absolutely. They, they, you, you, I mean, you, you, you and Eric Singer don't look all that dissimilar. I mean, I think they could just put you in there. And I mean, but can you sing Black Diamond? I guess that's the question. That's the question. <laughs> Oh, not not nearly as well. Um, I I can sing, but my voice is like really horrible. I feel like darkness will fall on the city, and, and they go, oh god. But uh, no, playing would definitely be a lot of fun. Oh, Mike, I'll tell you what, it's just uh, such a pleasure catching up with you, talking to you. If any time in the future you have anything you want to talk about, anything you want to promote, any shows coming up, if you're ever near Kansas City. You had better, best well get a hold of me and get a hold of us here at Music Mania, and we will we'll, uh, make sure we sync up and uh, and get you promoted around here, man. You're a great guy, great drummer, man, and we can't thank you enough for joining us, man. It's been a huge pleasure. Thank you so much, man. And I, when the next big musical chapter of my life starts, I definitely will let you guys know. Man, Mike, little, appreciate I'm it so much. Work. You betcha, man. We'll be in touch, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll hit you up soon, and we'll, may, we'll maybe do it again in the near future, my man. Cool. Thanks so much, Glenn. It's been a lot of fun. You bet, Mike. Thanks a lot. Okay. Take care.